Good morning or good afternoon and in this lecture we will be covering our uh, capsules. So before we start, let us first try to differentiate why is there a need for capsules and tablets. So the difference between our capsules and tablets versus our liquid preparations is that most capsules and tablets are tasteless when swallowed. And this is not always the case with our liquid medication. Numerous characteristics can help identify capsules and tablets as opposed to our liquid medications who are only based on their bottle. So if you remove your liquid medication from your bottle, you are now have you're going to have difficulty in determining what drug is it. And capsules and tablets are available for many medications in a variety of dosage strengths providing flexibility so if you have if you compare it to drug uh, to our liquid drugs it will come in a single strength and if you want to take a lesser dose you have to compute for the lesser dose as opposed to simply taking another capsule or tablet which has various strengths available in the market so here on the screen you can see the pill identifier by our drugs.com if you are un unfamiliar with the tablet or capsule you are handling, or if a patient brings you a sample of their drug, you can use this tool to quickly identify any capsule or tablet. So solid dosage forms are efficiently and productively manufactured. They are packaged and shipped at a lower cost with less breakage compared to liquid dosage forms. It's because liquid dosage forms are heavy they also need glass and they are much heavier than our tablets. They are also more stable and have longer shelf lives compared to their liquid counterparts. So since, solid, since capsules and tablets are solids, they tend to have a more chemically resistant uh, nature or they are less affected by chemical degradation as opposed to our liquid dosage forms. So capsules are solid dosage forms in which medicinal agents and or inert substances are enclosed in a small shell of gelatin. Gelatin capsules may be hard or soft depending on their composition and most filled capsules are intended to be swallowed whole. So most capsules are intended to be swallowed whole unless there is a special prescription by our doctor that instructs us to make paper tablets or to uh, divide our capsule into. However, it is common in hospitals or care facilities to crush tablets or open capsules and to mix it with food or drink or especially um, <clears throat> some par uh, nutrition mixtures. So if you are ever to mix capsules and tablets with our food by crushing or cutting, Please review the property of the capsule and tablet. It should only be done with under the guide of a licensed pharmacist since only the pharmacist can actually determine if it is safe to divide the capsule or tablet. Since there are several drug release characteristics of certain dosage forms that can adversely affect a patient's welfare. Take into, uh, an example of this is if you are to crush a <clears throat> extended release tablet instead of taking it whole you're going to receive a whole dose of the extended release so instead of uh, your body receiving the dose at an extended period of time your body is going to receive the whole dose at one time another example is for protected drugs like our enteric coated drugs which are to be protected from the stomach so if you crush the tablet, you're going to uh, render the coating for acid protection useless because you destroy the coating. So we have two types of our gelatin capsules. We have our hard gelatin capsules and we have our soft gelatin capsules. Hard gelatin capsules are, mo are used most in commercially medicated capsules. You can see on the background, those are what hard gelatin capsules look like. They are commonly employed in clinical drug trials to mitigate the placebo effect. Uh, the primary way 
of uh, making placebos is to make all uh, both the active drugs and the placebos look the same and the easiest way is to make a capsule a simple uncolored capsule would do the trick the community pharmacist also uses hard gelatin capsules in extemporaneous compounding of prescriptions if you are in a compounding pharmacy, it might be useful to have a range of different size gelatin capsules. So empty capsule cell shells are made of sugar, gelatin, and water. Mostly it is made out of gelatin. They can be clear, colorless, or tasteless, and they may be colored by various FDNC and DNC dyes. Please take note that the colorants used in gelatin capsules should be safe for human consumption. They can be made opaque by adding agents such as titanium oxide and most commercially available cup capsules combine colorants and opacants to make them distinctive from one another. So uh, companies do like it when their dosage forms are unique to the company. Take for example, if you imagine a orange and white capsule, you're going to think of Alaxan. So primarily, capsules are made out of gelatin, and gelatin is obtained by the partial hydrolysis of collagen obtained from the skin, white connective tissue, bones of animals. So our gelatin comes from our white connective tissue from our animals. Now, it might be as asked sometimes if your gelatin is halal for example you're in a uh, pharmacy in which there are muslim patients they might ask you where is this gelatin made of or where is the capsule made of sometimes gelatin comes from pigs so please be uh, aware of what is the nature of gelatin where did they get the gelatin okay you can get gelatin from beef pork and and you can also get it from fish Okay, and uh, it's up to you to know if where is your gelatin capsules made of. So in commerce, gelatin is available in the form of fine powder, a coarse powder, or in shreds and sheets. It doesn't matter because gelatin can easily melt. So gelatin is stable in air when dry, but is subject to microbial decomposition when it becomes moist. So if ever you encountered old capsules, they don't have the flexibility that they had back then. It's either it's brittle, meaning it's exposed to hot air, or it's soft, meaning it's exposed to moisture. So gelatin capsules contain hard gelatin capsules contain 13 to 16 percent of moisture. If they are exposed in an environment of high humidity, uh, additional moisture can be absorbed by the gelatin, and it causes the capsule to uh, distort or deform or to shrink or to lose their rigid shape so if you handle very soft tablets uh, I mean very soft capsules it might be wise to dispose of them since they are exposed to the humidity already in an environment of extreme dryness gelatin uh, the moisture in the gelatin capsule can actually evaporate so if the capsule is exposed to extreme heat it can actually become brittle because the water inside the gelatin evaporated out. Because gelatin moisture can be absorbed by gelatin capsules, <clears throat> because moisture can be absorbed by gelatin capsules, many capsules are packaged along with a small packet of desiccant. So this desiccant is your silica gel. You can find it uh, commonly in shoes and to protect leather, but you can also find it, find it in some bottles of capsules and tablets. The main purpose of the desiccant is it absorbs excess moisture from the air and it can protect your capsule or tablets. So the desiccant materials are often used are dried silica gel, clay, and activated charcoal. <clears throat> Prolonged exposure to high humidity can cause in vitro, uh, can affect in vitro capsule dissolution. Because this solution can affect bioavailability, this should be evaluated before making the final product. Okay, so uh, this should be inc included in your pre-formulation studies. 
Although gelatin is insoluble in cold water, it can soften up to 10 times its weight in water. And primarily, gelatin is soluble in hot water and in warm gastric fluid. Gelatin capsules rapidly dissolves and exposes its contents, and the gelatin itself being a protein from your uh, white connective tissue is digested by proteolytic enzymes and is absorbed. So uh, you are now aware that our capsules are not made out of plastic. They may look plasticky because of their uh, shininess, but they are actually gelatin. So if patients ask you, uh, will the capsules, if I take too much capsules, will it uh, clog up my digestive system? The answer is no, because the capsules are made out of gelatin and gelatin eventually is digested like normal food. So another uh, use of our gelatin capsules is they can be used for tracking the passage in your GI tract. So one of these methods is your gamma scintigraphy. It is a non-invasive procedure that entails the use of a gamma ray emitting radio tracer with a gamma camera coupled to a data recording device. So when it is combined in pharmacokinetic studies, the evaluation provides information about the transit and drug release patterns of the dosage form as well as the rate of drug absorption from the various regions of the gastrointestinal tract. So this is how gamma scintigraphy works. So the, uh, you can track the capsule with the radio emitter and a specialized device. And you can actually track it in your uh, GI tract. Okay, one uh, medical use of this is to determine if there is blockade of your intestines, like what you see in the picture. So this method is particularly useful in determining in vivo and in vitro bioavailability for dosage forms. It can also be used to assess integrity and transit time of enteric coated tablets. And primarily, it's used in drug and dosage form evaluation in new product development. Another technique is the use of a radio telemetric device termed the Heidelberg capsule. So this Heidelberg capsule is a mi miniature laboratory. You can imagine it as that. And once you take it, it's a large capsule. Uh, you can track the capsule and it will transmit information regarding gastric pH, gastric residence time, and gastric emptying of solid dosage forms in fasting and non-fasting human subjects. So this is good for developing new dosage forms. So how are hard gelatin capsule shells made? So hard gelatin capsule shells are manufactured in two sections. They have the body and they have the cap. The cap is shorter and the body is longer. The two parts overlap and join and the cap fitting snugly over the open end of the capsule body. The shells are produced industrially by the mechanical dipping of pins and pegs over the desired shape and diameter into a temperature controlled reservoir of melted gelatin mixture. So this is how it looks like. So the pins and pegs this, uh, actually uh, determine the shape and size of your capsule. So the pegs are cooled and it's dipped in hot gelatin mixture. So once the peg dips, gelatin will attach to the cooled pegs and it would rapidly form the base or the cap. So each plate is mechanically lowered to the gelatin bath and the pegs are submerged to the desired depth and maintained for the desired period to achieve the proper length and thickness of coating. It is important that the thickness of gelatin should be strictly controlled so that the capsule's body and cap fit snugly to prevent disengagement or to prevent uh, contents from leaking out. So a manufacturer can also uh, prepare distinctive looking capsules by altering the rounded shape of the capsule making pegs. So by uh, changing the shape of the pegs, you can make uh, the body producing peg uh, slightly rounded and the other slightly tapered. 
So one of the manufacturers prepares capsules differentiating it from other manufacturers. So you can see on the bottom, it is an example of a uniquely shaped capsule, which is your pulvules. This is made by Eli Lilly. One, uh, uh, the, the cap is normal while the body is tapered. Another manufacturer uses capsules with both ends tapered. So uh, they have a distinct shape and these are called your spansules by Smith Klein Beecham. Another innovation in capsule shell, shell design is the Coney Snap and the Coney Snap Supro. So uh, the original snap fit construction enables the two halves of the capsules to be positively joined through grooves in the shell walls. So the two groups fit into each other and reliably closing the entire capsule. Okay, so once the uh, body and the cap meet and they are pushed together, they are now unable to be separated without puncturing the capsule. So opening of such a filled capsule is difficult because the lower surface area provides less gripping surface to pull the two halves apart. This increases security of the contents and integrity of the capsules. After filling, some manufacturers also render their capsules tamper evident through various sealing techniques. Capsules and tablets may also be imprinted with the names or monograms of the manufacturer, the assigned national drug code, and other markings making the drug identifiable and distinguishable from other products. So why is there a need for tamper-evident medicine? So why do we need to uh, secure our drugs? There was an incident in the United States called the Chicago Tylenol murders. It was a series of poisoning related from drug tampering in the Chicago metropolitan area. The victims all had taken Tylenol branded acetaminophen capsules that were laced with the poison potassium cyanide. A total of seven people died in the original poisoning with the various subsequent copycat crimes. The incidents led to reforms in the packaging and over-the-counter substances to federal anti-tampering laws. So this is why our capsules and tablets are now tamper-evident. Most of our drugs are now tamper-evident. So to prevent cases like this one. <clears throat> Next, we have our different capsule sizes. So the size used for uh, the, uh, to determine what capsule size you will use, you have to determine how much you're going to fill the capsule. So the density and the comprehensibility of the fill will largely determine to the extent what may be packed in a capsule shell. So the large scale or small scale preparation of hard gelatin capsules is roughly divided into the following general steps. First is to develop and prepare the formulation and selecting the correct capsule size. Next is to fill the capsule shells. Third is capsule sealing. And fourth is cleaning and polishing the filled capsules. So when developing the formulation and selecting the capsule size, you have to determine or you have to take into consideration uh, the goals of your capsule. It should have accurate dosing. It has good bioavailability. Ease of making, it is stable and it is pharmaceutically elegant. In dry formulations, the active and inactive compounds must be blended to, be, to form a uniform mixture. Care is uh, employed, especially in low dosage drugs, in which they are potent, in which you must have a uniform mixture to prevent unevenness of dose. So pre-formulation studies are performed to determine whether all the formulation's bulk powders may be effectively blended together. Uh, if you are going to blend your active ingredient, you might want to use a diluent or a filler. The primary use of a diluent of, or filler is to produce the proper capsule fill volume. It's usually insufficient to simply put the active ingredient alone. So you're going to have a filler or diluent to completely fill the capsule. So that's why when you shake capsules, uh, they don't usually make a sound because capsules are usually full. 
either by pure drug or drug with a diluent or filler. Some examples of diluent or fillers are your lactose, microcrystalline cellulose, and starch. These are commonly used for this purpose. Other than acting as a filler, they also provide cohesion to the powders, which is beneficial in the transfer of the powder blend into capsule shells. You can also add disintegrants. So disintegrants are included in capsule formulation to assist the breakup and distribution of the capsule's contents. It's because if you don't add disintegrants, what you will have is mostly a large mass and it would actually slow down the solution. So to prevent the formation of a large mass, disintegrants are added to make sure that the mass breaks into smaller pieces once it is exposed into the stomach. Among the disintegrants used are pregelatinized starch, cross-carmelose, and sodium starch glycolate. To achieve uniform drug distribution, it is advantageous if the density and particle size of the drug and the non-drug components are similar. This is important when you are giving a low dose of drug. <clears throat> if necessary, particle size might be needed to reduce into the micrometer range. So it could be reduced by milling to form a uniform micronized uh, mixture. If you need lower particle sizes due to the nature of the drug, you can also employ micronization as well. So this is this will uh, form much finer powders than ordinary milling. In preparing capsules in an industrial scale using high-speed automated equipment, the powder mix or granules must be free-flowing to allow steady passage of the capsule fill from the hopper to the encapsulating equipment. So if you want to have a free-flowing powders which do not get stuck in a transfer of one machine to the other, you can add a lubricant or glidant. So the main goal of the lubricant or glidant is to facilitate flow. You can use fumes, silicon dioxide, magnesium stearate, calcium stearate, stearic acid, or talc to the powder to enhance flow properties. So advice, if ever you're going to hear stearate or stearic acid, it's a lubricant or glidant. Please take note that when magnesium stearate is used as a lubricant, it has waterproofing characteristics and it can retard penetration of gastrointestinal fluids and it could cause delay of dissolution and absorption. Uh, certain, uh, surface active agents such as sodium laurel sulfate or our SLS can be used to facilitate wetting by gastrointestinal fluids to overcome the problem. Inserting tablets or small capsules into other capsules is useful in commercial production and mostly useful for extemporaneous preparation of capsules. The main reason why we add capsules to capsules is primarily done to separate incompatible agents or to add pre-measured amounts of potent drug substance. So rather than weighing a potent drug which can lead to errors, the pharmacist may choose to insert a prefabricated tablet of the desired strength in each capsule and other potent agents and diluents then may be weighed and added. So here are the different examples of fill in hard gelatin capsules. So gelatin capsules are unsuitable for aqueous liquids because as you know, water will be absorbed in the gelatin and it would cause the gelatin capsule to deform. However, there are some liquids such as fixed or volatile oils that do not interfere with the stability of gelatin shells and may be placed in locking gelatin capsules to ensure retention of the liquid. So rather than placing a liquid such as a capsule, the liquid may be mixed with an inert powder to make a wet mass or a paste which may then be placed in capsules in the usual manner. Eutectic mixtures of drugs, like we discussed in our powders, has a propensity to liquefy when admixed. They may be mixed with a diluent or an absorbent, such as magnesium carbonate, kaolin, or light magnesium oxide to separate the interacting agents and to absorb any liquefied material that may form. 
So do not place your eutectic mixtures in a single capsule because they will liquefy and they will soften the capsule. So as mentioned previously, some manufacturers make tamper-evident capsules by sealing the joint between the two capsule parts. One capsule manufacturer makes distinctively uh, looking capsules by sealing them with a colored band of gelatin. So this is your capsules by Park Davis. So as you can see, the pink band is colored gelatin. Capsules may also be sealed through a heat welding process that fuses the capsule cap to the body through the double wall thickness at their juncture. So what you can do is to heat the capsule just enough that it melts but not too much that it totally deforms. So uh, if you're ever going to seal capsules extemporaneously, meaning you're in a compounding pharmacy, although it may be difficult and tedious, you may seal capsules by using gelatin. You're going to melt gelatin solution and you're going to apply the gelatin solution over the cap and the body. When it melts, you will form a seal. However, it is uh, messy and tedious to make. So after uh, the small, uh, after making the capsules and sealing them, you're ought to clean and polish the capsules. Why do you need to clean and polish? Number one, a good capsule is clean and sparkling or shiny. It shows the professionalism of the pharmacist who made the capsule. Second, uh, powders that have stuck to the gelatin in the outside layers will add a bitter taste when the patient is taking them, leading to an unpleasant experience. That is why it is good practice to clean and polish capsules before they are dispensed. On a small scale, capsules may be cleaned individually or in small numbers by rubbing them with a clean gauze or a cloth. If you're in the large scale, on the other hand, many machines are used to clean capsules. So you can place them in a rotating chamber with a vacuum that removes any extraneous materials as they exit the equipment, as you can see on the right side of the screen. So we have talked about hard gelatin capsules. Let's now talk about soft gelatin capsules. Soft gelatin capsules are made of gelatin, which which has glycerin or polyhydric alcohol as sorbitol to add. Soft gelatin capsules are used to encapsulate hermetically sealed liquids, suspensions, pasty materials, dry powders, and even preformed tablets. Soft gelatin capsules are pharmaceutically elegant and are easily swallowed. So the most common soft gelatin capsules you will encounter is vegetable oil capsules, particularly cod liver oil is formed in a soft gelatin form. Soft gelatin capsules may be prepared by the plate process using a set of molds to form the capsules or a more efficient rotary or uh, reciprocating die process which they are produced, filled, and sealed in a continuous operation. So I will be linking the videos uh, to you so you can watch them how they are prepared. The uses of soft gelatin capsules vary. So liquids that may be encapsulated into soft gelatin capsules include the following. You could add water immiscible volatile and non-volatile liquids such as oils, hydrocarbons, ethers, esters, alcohols, and organic acids. You can also add water miscible non-volatile liquids such as polyethylene glycols, and you can also add water miscible and non-volatile compounds like your propylene glycol and your isopropyl alcohol. Please take note that liquids that can pass through the capsule shells are not suitable for gelatin capsules because you are going past the point wherein the capsules will be useful. If the liquids can only seep out, uh, it's a failure of a dosage form. So finally, we have the compendial requirements for capsules. So these are primary quality control procedures that are necessary for our capsules. So first, for our added substances, you cannot add uh, substances that can disturb your dosage form. So in, in particular, 
substances added to official preparations including capsules to enhance their stability, usefulness, elegance, or to facilitate their manufacture can only be used, number one, if they are harmless in the quantities used. Okay? It does not cause poisoning or toxicity in those that will consume the tablet. Number two, they do not exceed the minimum amounts required to provide their intended effect. Meaning, example, you need a lubricant, you only need to use the minimum amount. Do not go over the minimum amount. Number three, it does not impair the product's bioavailability, therapeutic efficacy, or safety. And number four, it does not interfere with the requisite compendial assays and tests. So if there's going to be a test for purity or a uh, percent label claim determination and your excipient disturbs that process, it cannot be used. Next is the USP prescribes different containers for dispensing capsules. So there is a list of specifications, each with their official description. So uh, the, uh, the different containers could be tight, well-closed, light-resistant, and or all of these. There could be a combination of different uh, requirements. So for tight, a tight container protects the contents from contamination by extraneous liquids, solids, and vapors, from the loss of the article, from efflorescence, deliquescence, or evaporation under ordinary or customary conditions of handling, shipment, storage, and distribution. Therefore, no substance can go in and no substance can go out. Next is well closed. A well closed container protects the extraneous protects the contents from extraneous liquids and loss of the article or customary conditions of handling, shipment, storage and distribution. This means solid particles cannot go in and the tablets and capsules do not go out. However, it does not dictate that vapors and liquids could go in and out of the bottle light resistance simply means that it protects the contents from light either you are uh, rendering the container opaque or you are adding a certain element to protect it from uv light a good example is our amber colored bottles next you have your disintegration test so the disintegrate the disintegrate disintegration test for capsules are a test to determine if your capsules dissolve in human physiologic conditions. So the, te uh, the apparatus used is the basket rack assembly, which is rotating 30 times per second over 37 degrees. To satisfy the test, the capsules disintegrate completely into a soft mass with no palpably firm core and only some fragments of the gelatin shell. So disintegrate completely with no palpable core is the definition for disintegrated. Dissolution test is to be discussed in your tablets, but the dissolution test for capsules uses the same apparatus as your dissolution test for tablets that are uncoated. Weight variation test is demonstrated by determining weight variation and or content uniformity. To perform the weight variation test, 10 capsules are individually weighed and their contents removed. The emptied shells are individually weighed and the net weight of the contents is calculated by subtraction. From the results of an assay performed as directed in the individual monograph, the content of the active ingredient in each capsule can be determined. There is another procedure for soft gelatin capsules. The gross weight of 10 intact capsules are determined individually. Then each capsule is cut open and the contents are removed by washing with a suitable solvent. The solvent is then to evaporate. And the, indiv the individual shells are weighed and the net contents are calculated. From the results of the assay directed from the individual monograph, the content of the active ingredient in each of the capsules is determined. So it's not simply weighing, you still need to determine a percent content using 
and assay. Content uniformity, unless otherwise stated in the USP, the amount of active ingredient determined by the assay is within 85 to 115% of the label claim for 9 out of 10 dosage units with no unit outside the range of 70 to 125% of the label claim. When we say label claim, uh, this is what's on the label. So if you say paracetamol 500 milligrams, 500 milligrams is your label claim. Content labeling requirement, all official capsules must be labeled to express the quantity of each active ingredient in each dosage unit. And finally, there is a moisture permeation test. The USP determine, requires determination of the moisture permeation characteristics for a single unit and unit dose containers to ensure suitability for the packaging capsule. The degree and rate of moisture penetration are determined by packaging the dosage unit together with a color revealing desiccant palette, exposing the package unit to known relative humidity over a specified time and observing the desiccant palette if it changes for color. If it changes the color, it means the uh, moisture has entered the container. And you're going to compare the pretest and the post weights of the package units as well. So this is to determine if moisture was able to uh, be absorbed by your capsules. So that is it for our capsules. I hope you learned something today. And kindly read your textbook. And let's see you all on our tablets. Thank you for listening and goodbye.